Hello and welcome to Second Rate Film School. My name is Andrew Wass, and today we're going to be discussing one of mine and a lot of people in my generation's favorite TV shows, Courage of the Cowardly Dog. From its inception to the episodes you remember, the ones you've forgotten, its legacy and beyond, we're going to cover it all. This is the third and final part of our retrospective. Part 1 explored the origins of Courage and general behind-the-scenes information. Part 2 explored specific episodes like Freaky Fred and Last of the Star Makers. So if you haven't checked out either of those, pause this video and go check out the link in the description below. Then come on back and check out this third part. Without further ado though, let me reintroduce our guests. Our first guest star is series creator, director, and writer John R. Dilworth. Hello, Andrew. Very nice to be here. Nice to be anywhere, but especially here. Next up, we have the head writer of the show, David Stephen Cohen. Thank you, thank you. Staff writer and animatic supervisor, William Hohauser. I, I thank you, and I, I thank you for uh, having me here. I hope uh, I can clarify a few things uh, of what we're talking about. Musical composer Jody Gray. Hi. Good to see you. And last but not least, the man behind the voice of Courage and his screams, Marty Grabstein. Welcome to the show. Hey, this is yeah, just a pleasure to be here with Andrew over here on on another delightful Zoom call. I look forward to whatever we're going to be creating together. It's, I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. So now on to the final part of this retrospective. Today we're going to be exploring production issues, the final episodes of the show, its legacy, and beyond. So for the last time, let's head out to the middle of nowhere and dive right in. <laughs> Something horrible wants to destroy our humble nowhere shack. Who will protect our home? Someone protect our home. Who will protect our home? Courage the cowardly dog. Courage the cowardly dog. Courage the cowardly dog. So, William, you mentioned something in the previous part of the retrospective that I'd like to discuss a little further. You had mentioned that even though there are technically only four seasons of the show, Cartoon Network split them up and build them as five seasons. Um, the DVD set actually doesn't mention that. It only lists the four production seasons. Would you be able to shed a little light on this? Well, I'm 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 actually surprised. I I didn't know. I I don't ha I didn't get the box set. I I you know it's not like they said, oh, you worked on the show. Here's a box set. They're like, you pay like everybody else, jerk. The reason the show ended when it did, uh, it, it, at the end of what for us was the fourth season, was due to a <laughs> confluence of events and uh, corporate. Uh, Unempathy, non-empathy for the people making their product. Uh, so, what happened is, is that uh, for the third season, I believe it was the third season, uh, they there was a pending writers' strike, and the network said, "Look, um, a writers' strike affects the writing." Now. I wasn't in the union, but David was, or I mean, he probably still is, David is. The other writers who they were bringing in to do individual episodes were all in the Writers Guild. And they said, there's going to be a Writers Guild strike, and we want you to do two seasons of writing in a row. So, you know, you have to, you know, what's a season? Well, we did 13 episodes and uh, I believe it was 13 episodes a season. It may have been less, but it was two stories per episode. So, you know, it's like, oh, we're not just writing 13 episodes. We're writing 26 episodes, essentially, because each story, most of the time, were, were separate stories with different characters, different scenarios, you know. So a little more work, you know, and also, you know, different backgrounds, but that was the art department. They weren't going on strike. So they said, okay, we just would like you to, you know, gird your loins and write and write and write and get out uh, two seasons. We did. And that was all uh, well and good. And um, it, then the writer strike didn't happen. It, it was settled. And so I went and 
personally, because I, you know, I, I was the one person who was in the writer's room, <laughs> then, get, you know, checking all the scripts, and then I was in the animatic room. So I was sort of like the one person, except aside from John, who was like basically, you know, almost, I was 75% through each episode. John was 100%, I was 75 and no one else was. That was, uh, you know, the, the artists were picking up at a certain point, uh, uh, that, that whole thing. So I said, to, I said to Cartoon Network, I said, okay, look, the writer strike isn't happening. Can we at least have a production break for you know three months or whatever whatever the break was between season one and season two and then I guess season three there was there, that there was a break too, and they said no. No, they said why? Oh, we've already scheduled it that you're just going to keep working. You have to keep working. If it's going to ruin everything if you don't keep working, and it's like oh, okay, and we kept working and uh, we were destroyed. Everybody, uh, everybody was was by the end of the well, our fourth season, it was like we could we couldn't even think we couldn't it was like well, we're gonna come up with new episodes we can't come up so we sort of had a feeling at the end of the fourth one as that's why those remembrance of courage past and perfect uh, sort of came out it was like we were just like okay you know if if we're not if it's not the end of the road. We'll just hold on to the scripts because they were approved and blah 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 blah. Well, we were just like blasted. And John called me up one day. I, I don't know if he called other people to ask, but he called all, he called me up, and he says, "Well, they want a fifth season. What's your thinking?" And I said, "No. I said I, you know, I I want a I want a year off or something." He says, "No, they want us to do just two month, two or three, the normal two or three months and." start in again and i i said i can't do it and john agreed i think he he didn't agree i think that was his feeling too you know he just wanted to hear it from somebody else or, or he asked a lot of people i don't know but you know he definitely asked me and i just said i can't do it i i'm i i'm t i don't care about the money it, it's my brain you know it, it's like i can't by the, the end of the fourth season uh, fourth season i had like divorce you know i haven't divorced myself but i was really not contributing into the whole process as much as i was the first three seasons and it, I, it, was, it was just exhaustion it was like I, oh i get a script i, I have to fix it eh. <laughs> it's fine you know it's like I, i'm 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 tired I, i'm working all you know onto the night every weekday and oh and there's another thing that had happened in the meantime, 9-11, 9-11, and we were New York based, we were in Manhattan when 9-11, you know, doing the show when 9-11 happened. And my office was in a, in a shutdown area, like, you know, they shut down Manhattan, lower Manhattan after that. And, you know, and for a while, you know, at one point there was no electricity um, and I couldn't get in my office. And I'm getting phone calls going, why isn't work on the show happening right now? What's the matter? We're, we're going behind schedule. And I, you know, and, and Dan said it most succinctly, he goes, do you realize that this country has just been attacked? <laughs> it's like, it was like, it was like nothing had happened. It was, it was, it was like, what's the matter with you lazy people? <laughs> Why aren't you working on this really important cartoon show, you know, right as an airplanes flying into the buildings overhead and things are coming, people are dying like right next to us. And, you know, oh, you're you're not working on the show. You're bad workers. And it's like, I don't want to say where that was coming from because I'm not sure, but that was definitely. And I just said, no, I'm not. There's no animatic work happening until my neighborhood is opened up again and I could actually go into the office building you know uh so that was that i don't i don't remember which maybe that was the four, beginning of the fourth season or sometime in the fourth while we were working on you know, that happened but that was really tough i can't speak for the production schedule but according to the air dates it happened in the middle of season two yeah Remember somewhere's that. around there you know but that's the thing it was like it, it's it was a blur because there was no season three season four for us there was, it was just work constant work 
And, you know, it was like, I had a job, I had to go to Iceland and film something. And that, that was a big deal. Oh, how dare you go to Iceland and have another job from someone else? You know, aren't we paying you enough? No, uh, you're not paying me enough that I'm not gonna go to Iceland for a week. Uh, you know, for, for other clients that I should have the freedom, you know, I thought I was gonna have three months to work for. Anyway, that's my gripe, I'll, I'll get out of that. Yeah, hey, get off my lawn, you know. Uh, so we were really tired and we, we just said to them, no, there's no fifth season. Um, it's not that we didn't have ideas. It was, it was just, it couldn't do it. And next thing we know, they've taken sort of like season three and instead of showing all the episodes, they held two back. And then they had so, you know, then they showed some episodes of season four and they held the rest of it back. And then they said, it's season five, there it is. We, we did five seasons. I, I don't know why that was important to them. There, there may have been some reason, but it, it, it escapes me. It was tough. I mean, you know, you know, it's exhilarating in some point that, you know, because, because you're made, you made the work, but at some point you reach this thing where you're like, I can't think anymore. And uh, you're, you're just, you're just doing the job, but you're not happy uh, entirely. Uh, and also Lionel, uh, Lionel had passed away. So we, we were working with um, a new voice person whose name, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. If, I don't remember your name. I hope you're not alive to come and haunt me. Oh, maybe if you're a ghost, you haunt me. That'd be okay. Arthur Anderson was the new voice of Eustace. Arthur, yes, Arthur Anderson. He's also passed away, so he can haunt you. You know, so, so we were dealing with like, you know, how do we use tracks of Lionel with the new person who didn't sound quite the same? you know, at all, but, you know, we, we had a lot, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of things that happened. I have nothing to say. I mean, he tried, I mean, I mean, it was like who we could get. I mean, it was who John picked and uh, he tried. Uh, Lionel was a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, he hadn't passed, to, I, I, you know, he hadn't passed away yet, but um, he quit. He wasn't feeling good. And uh, he had some, you know, when, when you're a voice actor on these shows, you're, I don't know exactly the, 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 the details. I wasn't part of it. You know, the, you would have to ask the producer exactly what the contractual details were, but they had to do work for Cartoon Network, not, not just the show. So all the promos and everything were Cartoon Network people running it and not, not, a, not, not John. Those are different people. You know, John would get somebody like Lionel and he would, cast them because Lionel could do the part, not because it was somebody you had to like, you know, do 20, 30 takes to get one line out of. It was like, oh, this guy could just, he, you know, he's going to hit it on the first take or the third take at, at worst. And uh, I, I heard the takes and, and you know, there was freak, frequently, it was, I didn't hear that many takes. I would get, because I would get the audio. And I would put the audio track together before the, you know, the actual animatic. Uh, actually, no, no, I, I would put it together and drop in the, the pictures at the same time uh, just to get the timing. Uh, but, you know, Lionel and uh, Thea and uh, uh, Marty, uh, they, they were people who could pretty much do it on very single, you know, very few takes. They, they were the parts, they knew the parts. They, they once they started the show, they got through a couple, of, they knew what to do and they were good at it. But when you get a corporate person who's bringing somebody into a voice session, there's like three takes ain't gonna cut it. It, it looks like they're, they're not doing their job. So they will make you do 30 takes just so they could tell their bosses that, oh, I did the job. I made them do 30 takes. Well, the first one was perfect. What about the other 29? Well, don't talk about these things. This is not something we talk about in corporate settings. And um, he just basically couldn't, he, he, he would come in, he, well, he, was, he was old, and, but he would come in and you know, be finished within an hour. And, and, and John would congratulate him and he felt good he would go into session with with a cartoon network person I, i'm not pointing fingers i don't know the exact i wasn't there but you know they would make him do so many takes and he just he was like exhausted it seemed to be that was the point of contention for lionel and he was like i can't work for i can work for john but i can't work for these people and he quit
he didn't want to do it anymore. So he retired from the show. That's that's as far as I know what happened. Uh, I, I could be wrong. Now, Marty, did you experience anything similar to this? Well, first of all, let me respond to what you just said. And you said we're going to learn things. I did not know that Lionel retired from the role. I thought he died. And that's why he couldn't do the role anymore. And so Arthur Anderson took the role. Didn't Lionel die? It's a little complicated. From what I can tell, he did die after he retired, but it was in between production seasons. So whether he decided to retire or not, it wouldn't have ultimately mattered. Did not know that at all. Wow. Oh, man. I did not know that. So the answer to did I have any problem? I didn't give why. I was tickled to be doing this kind of work. Listen, I how old was I? I was in I was like, um, let's say, you know, in my 40s, you know, it was, you know, and he was in his, what, 80s for him. I guess he felt it, it was overkill uh, for me. It was I was I was tickled that there were going to be commercials like that. I was going to be doing these commercials. I didn't care. I got paid in my mind. I got paid well. And I knew I was getting I was getting all these, you know, first of all, the second season was the most profitable season for me ever as an actor, because not only was I getting all of my money that I was being paid for those recording sessions, but I was also getting all the first season residuals. So I was getting, and those are high residuals. The first early few years of residuals, you're getting a lot of money. Then it goes down and down and down to what it is now. And it stays right at this, you know, deathly low level, but still I get money. I mean, I still get a few thousand a year from Courage, you know, getting $6.76 for each cartoon. But it was like, you know, so me, I was like, Sure, you need me. You want to use me. So I was just feeling like I'm doing fine. What do I care? I didn't care at all. I, I had a totally different experience. And anytime I went in, anytime I record, oh, by the way, sometimes they would have me come in and I would be getting a separate recording uh, uh, session fee for the for the promotions. They would bring me in and have me in and I would get paid for those. I would get paid for that. For session fees. So I don't know what he's talking. I mean, uh, I don't know what he's talking about. It, I mean, especially what that would make him retire. What was he worried that between you off the record? You don't have, don't have to print it because I didn't know the guy that well. He seemed like a very nice guy. You're in your 80s. You're being asked to do like what? What do you mean? It's too much for a guy my age. Too much to do what? Say say a few lines uh, into a microphone. What the hell? You're not jumping. You're not jumping out of a moving car. I mean, and you're getting, why would you leave the show? I'm shocked from this. Why would you leave the show? You're in your eighties. You're still working as an actor. You're still getting the work. Who do you care? More work. He wasn't a superstar. He wasn't Tom Hanks. So, you know, and you're in your eighties. How many more years you got left? God willing a lot, but you know, I would say just keep working. Why would he leave? I'm I'm blown away. You don't have to, you know, whatever you want to do with my response. I don't care if you put that in or not. <laughs> well, that's good because it's staying in. Fair enough that you don't feel that the extra stress was worth retiring over. But does that assessment of them keeping you longer when you're recording promos hold true? I don't know what he's talking about once again. Because I sometimes had to do 10 takes. Usually it was two or three takes. Sometimes it was one take. More often than not, it was two or three. Occasionally, it would be many takes on the same line. Over and over again. Of the, You know what? Try it again this way. Or try it again that way. As a matter of fact, I have a story that, that, that seems to rebut that. I... Uh, it was it was a moment when courage. I don't know what the episode was, but he pops his head up out of the ground, pops out of this like lush forest with trees around. It's kind of ominous looking, and he's just his head is popped out of the ground. And he goes like this. He's looking around, and he goes, and all he's supposed to go is, hmm, hmm, right, something like that, hmm, right. So I remember uh, uh, Peter saying, okay, so you're kind of 
a little bit confused, but also anxious. So I go, hmm? Go, no, I, you're confused, but I don't hear anxious. I need anxious. Hmm? No, 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 too many. Too, first of all, hmm, just one syllable. You're doing it like, hmm? You're doing it like two syllables. Just, just do one syllable. And then we said, and then at one point I go, hmm? And they go, no, see, you're losing courage. Now we're losing courage. We need to bring bring it back up. We're losing courage. This went on, I swear I did about 20 takes on that thing. 20 takes on, hmm. And at the end, they said, I think we got it. Either way, I, I'm sure we have it in the in the in the library anyway. I, I swear to God, 20 takes on, on one word. Uh, mostly we get it because we know what we're doing. It's not as if it's deliberately set up in those recording sessions that it's understood that two, three takes, maybe a fourth. No, it's not understood at all. Nobody understood any of that. You get it. We move on. If they need more from you, you're being paid. That you got to give them what they want. That's my thinking. Anyway crazy it's actually interesting how different their viewpoints were one wonders if lionel had a much different experience being an old school voice actor and that these sessions back in the 60s were notably easier on him meanwhile marty being a newer actor didn't know anything different this is how all sessions were though there's also just the very real possibility that given lionel's advancing age and proximity to his death maybe it was too much for him to handle regardless and 10 years earlier this would have been fine Unfortunately, we can't ask the, the guy himself. I wish we could. Sadly, you're right. Uh, one voice actor we really haven't talked about, but was just as pivotal in the show as you guys were, was the late, great Thea White, who voiced Muriel. Can you discuss a little what it was like working with her? Thea would have, <laughs> would have had her own special uptake on the whole thing. God bless her. What a funny lady she was. What a terrific, funny, funny lady. You know, when you see Muriel, that is Thea. Except that Thea is darker, a little darker than, than Muriel. Uh, but her warmth, her love, her, you know, she, you know, totally, that was Thea. Now, getting back to the Accelerate production schedule, Jody, this question will obviously depend on what episode we're referring to and how evolved the score was. But generally speaking, how far along into the production of the episode would you be brought in to start doing the score? And did you notice, much like they were with the writing having to speed up, that your scores had to be sped up too? Uh, I, I think um, it depends on what year it was. The first season, we had a little bit leeway, you know, because we would get some um, animatics so we could look at it. Later on, it became so fast that it would be like we would finish one episode and we'd have to go on to the, act, the next. It was like crazy. So um, I would say the beginning, since we had a little bit of lag time, kind of set the stage. So we kind of got more and more in, in, you know, in sync with John and how he wanted to go. And, you know, John, John is not a musician at all, but he has a lot of music in his head and he hears stuff, but it's kind of like trying to pull the stuff out of him. It's, what are you looking for, John? What's the emo so we get the emotional content of what he was looking for, and we try to match that. So yeah, it was it was pretty good in the beginning. Then it got crazier and crazier. But by that time, we knew well enough. So some of that stuff took like like I think um, the first snowman episode, for instance, took like a day. We just did it because it had all the ice. So like it had this. Uh, this really cool sample of a very icy sound. So we built it in there and mixed it with, um, with Eskimo chants and drums. And put it all together and it just was so fast. Other episodes took like a week, you know, because they were just so deep. And so they needed so much stuff. And some of the, you know, those shows have like 30 or 40 pieces of music in them, you know. If it wasn't dictated specifically, 
you know, like for instance, the ride of the Valkyries, that was very specific. John wanted to do the ride of the Valkyries, you know, and it couldn't be like Chuck Jones, the ride of the Valkyries. Um, it had to be something like was that was really original. So, you know, it took a while to put all that together. You know, um, it just really depends. I guess, you know, I'm just thinking back as you're asking a question. It just really depends on what it was. We were able to do, you know, some really wacky stuff fast and later faster. <laughs> I think that really highlights yours and Andy's musical skills that no matter how accelerated the production schedule was, you were still writing just as good music. Well, all good things must come to an end, including courage. But luckily for us, the last episode contains, I think, the two best segments of the entire series, Remembrance of Courage Past and Perfect. Like I said in the second part of the retrospective, I think a lot of people forget how emotional this show could be. They just think of it as the scary show. So it might be really surprising that the scary show doesn't end with a scary episode. Both segments are emotional, heartfelt episodes front and center. I'm mad enough to admit, even nearing 30, both of these still get me misty-eyed anytime I watch them. So let's break them down in the order they aired. First up, we have Remembrance of Courage Past. This segment opens up with Courage eager to eat his favorite meal made by Muriel. As he eagerly eats it, he pours himself a big glass of milk and on the carton notices a series of missing dog posters. Courage goes into a catatonic trance, and we see a flashback of Courage as a puppy playing with his parents in a park. <laughs> of course, this being Courage, something bad happens, and he has to be taken to the vet. While there, the vet ominously asks his parents to come with him in the next room. The flashback ends with Courage witnessing his parents caught in a net by the vet and being taken deeper into the clinic. Back in the present, Courage remains catatonic, even ignoring Eustace's abuse, staying in the same position all night. The next morning, Muriel is very concerned about Courage, and we see that even Eustace's Ooga Booga Booga mask doesn't scare or phase him for the only time in the entire series. I think it's time we took Courage to the vet. We then cut to Courage screaming in panic as he realizes this is the same veterinary clinic as in the flashback. Courage attempts to run away from the vet, which triggers another flashback in which he sees his parents being forced into a giant rocket ship. As the countdown nears zero, he attempts in vain to rescue the parents. Unfortunately, before he can free them, Courage is spotted by the mad vet, whom then chases the young pup around the launch pad. Courage is then forced to escape via a nearby trash chute. Outside the veterinarian's office, he can only helplessly watch as his parents are launched into space. Back in the present, the vet captures Courage, forces him into another rocket, and Muriel and Eustace discover this and are captured by the vet as well, who reveals that he's actually a mad scientist with a goal of breeding superior dogs in space. When he tries to force Eustace and Muriel into the rocket, Courage is able to escape and then free the pair while trapping the vet in his own rocket. It's a nice parallel that Courage's successful attempt to rescue his adoptive parents, Muriel and Eustace, mirrors his failed attempt to save his parents back when he was a puppy, so therefore we can see that he's able to let go of the guilt he has felt over all these years. After the rocket launch is setting the vet into space, Muriel praises Courage for saving the day. This triggers another flashback, showing us puppy Courage one last time, crying in the alley behind the vet. When a younger Muriel finds him and comforts the crying puppy, commenting on how brave he is to be here. What courage you have. Would you like to come home with me? Call your courage. We'll have a grand time. So it's at this point we realize that this is the extended origin story of what we've seen in the opening credits of every single episode. Abandoned as a pup, he was found by Muriel. It also explains where Courage got his name in a way that is just so sweet and loving. It really just makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. The episode ends with the trio at home as they wonder what happened to the vet. We then see the rocket has crash landed on the moon with a pack of very angry dogs, including Courage's parents, ready to attack the vet. So this segment is just all around great, and it's my personal favorite of the series. Taking a throwaway joke of Courage being abandoned as a puppy and turning it into this really soulful story about the loss of his parents, the guilt he's felt all these years, but at the same time, showing us the beginning of that very loving relationship between him and Muriel, 
And also that the name we always just thought was an ironic joke that he was named Courage actually was the first of many acts of love she showed Courage is just really wonderful. So, John, what was the creation of this segment like? Yeah, I always knew that Courage was an orphan and to be abandoned. All, all of these things are so natural for childhood. You know, the fear of abandonment and the loss of love and being a dog. It was so easy to work through that you know, a child, a child's point of view or feelings, what little I knew about it, because I wasn't a child. But I was projecting, you know, fears that I had when I was a child. The other segment that was paired with this was perfect. And as heavy as it can get, it is, and no pun intended, the perfect way to have ended the series. The segment opens up with Eustace berating Courage for messing up all of his chores around the farm. <laughs> Stupid dog! You did it wrong! Conversely, we see when he messes up cooking with Muriel, she always sees the brighter side and doesn't blame him. <laughs> oh well. Don't worry, Courage. This time you crush the nuts and I'll bread the fish. Courage leaves the room and encounters the villain of the episode, an old-fashioned school marm who immediately criticizes Courage. You are a disgrace! <laughs> the school marm then begins taunting Courage, saying that he'll never be perfect. That is no way to stand. I want to see perfect posture. Shoulders back, chin out, ears up, and walk. We see a series of lessons being taught to Courage on how to be perfect, which despite his best effort, he still fails at. <laughs> work of another of my pupils. A perfect pupil. Yours is decidedly not perfect. <gasps> that night, a very clearly distressed Courage keeps having nightmares in various animation styles about him constantly failing. You're not perfect. Nightmares highlight the use of mixed media that I've mentioned previously in the retrospective. We get CGI, claymation, stop motion, and just 2D animation, animation that looks like paper cutouts, and a whole host of others, all in about like a minute and a half. What's really impressive here is most shows wouldn't have gone through the effort of showing multiple nightmares. They would have shown one and that would have been it, and you still get the idea that Courage is afraid of failure. Here though, we get multiple where we keep seeing him failing in different ways. This is really great because it highlights the impact the lessons the school marm is teaching has on Courage, that his head is now just filled with thoughts of failure. The episode ends with a deeply shaken and sleep-deprived Courage going to the bathroom before his final exam to determine if he's perfect. While in there, he sees the fish the trio was meant to eat for dinner that night swimming in the bathtub, which then gives him some words of encouragement. There's no such thing as perfect. You're beautiful as you are, Courage. With all your imperfections, you can do anything. As Courage leaves the bathroom, Muriel offers him some baklava, noting that it's not very good, but still finding the brighter side in it. And Eustace, who's been attempting to fix a broken horn throughout the episode, happily is ready to start a band, despite it still being broken. It's a really great moment because we get to see the fish's words of encouragement about perfection not mattering, in practice with Eustace and Muriel. Back in the attic, Courage, now more confident, goes in to take his final exam, and even though he doesn't do it perfectly, he still completes the task. The school marm freaks out over his imperfection, and then this causes her to melt like the Wicked Witch of the West. The episode, and thus the series, ends with our trio happily eating dinner, content in their perfectly imperfect lives. <laughs> Okay, I swear I'm not trying to make a joke here. 
But I truly think it's perfect that the scariest thing in this episode comes from Courage's own self-doubt and neuroses that have been built up about him thinking he's a failure. We've all felt the pressure to try and be perfect, and we all know the crushing feeling that we have when we don't achieve that. Hell, in even trying to do this retrospective, I've been ripping my hair out and stressing for months trying to figure out how to make it, well, perfect. So if a nearly 30-year-old can find reassurance and comfort in this episode, you can only imagine how great this must be for the target audience. Put yourself in the mindset that you were back in grade school. Not too long prior to that, you were a toddler who really didn't have much pressure in your life whatsoever. Now you're at school and yeah, you know, there's still a lot of fun stuff. It's not like adulthood. But they've gone from 0 to 60 pretty quick. Now you have a teacher potentially like that school marm trying to force you into a very rigid set of rules. Make sure you color in the lines. Make sure you get 100 on this test. Make sure you get perfect attendance. Make sure you stay in line as you go to your classes and so forth and so on. That's a lot of pressure to put on little kids as they're just learning the basics of life. Now comes this episode, which reassures them that you're beautiful the way you are, that you don't need to change, that there's no such thing as perfect, so don't worry about it. The pairing of these two segments together to make the final episode, I think is just dynamite, and to me, makes it the best episode of the series, and like I said, my personal favorite. But I'm not alone in that summation, because this is the highest ranked episode on IMDb. So, John, I have to congratulate you and the team. You literally went out on top. Well, that's a pity because I really wanted to do a fifth season. But uh, the show proved uh, a challenge for the new management at the time. And when I learned that we weren't going to get a fifth season, it was it was vital. Don't you think, Andrew, to write that last episode that would shed more uh, on the on the history of the characters and what the, and what the little dog meant. And what was so lovely is that I hired, I engaged my, a, a mentor of mine, uh, the filmmaker, Michael Sporn, who really gave my, he gave me one of my, among my early breaks, he would do, he would adapt children's um, books into animated films. And he was also nominated for an Oscar for Abel's Island. And um, I had a great time. And so I was able to reciprocate by having him do this whole sequence where Courage is just a little, little pup with his parents. Now, Jody, to me, a major aspect of why I love these episodes so much is your musical score. How do you view these episodes? The thing is, I agree with you. Because looking back, you know, it was like, wow, what a fitting ending to you know, the fourth season. I mean, they were just brilliant. We, um, Andy and I said, okay, this is when Courage is a little kid. So what do we do here? Okay, we will play the Courage theme on children's instruments. (laughs) 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 All right. So we bought a, like a little tiny piano, like literally like, you know, a little tiny piano and um, played the Courage theme on it. And similarly in um, Perfect, I played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Mozart or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, because it was, uh, you know, a school marm and it made sense. But each time it was played, it got darker and more kind of fucked up, you know, and it was like, so it was, you know, they told the story, you know, the story was there if you want to look at it. And, you know, David and I are like, like brothers from another mother. We're really close. And uh, it's kind of like uh, we were congratulating each other, like without even really working together. You know, we've since worked on a lot of stuff together. But that time, you know, he was writing these scripts that were like butter. I mean, I could just they just made so much sense and they were so dark and crazy and, you know, fun at the same time. I can speak for a lot of people and say these did sound great and then some. Now to your point of playing the Courage theme on a children's piano, um, that brings up something I'd like to discuss. There are several examples throughout this episode and through the series in general where you would have to play music beautifully crappy is how I would describe it. And I have the utmost respect for a musician who can do that. Being able to play something that's considered bad but not so bad people want to turn off the TV, really has to take a lot of talent. So what was the process of writing scores like this and how much trial and error was involved in it? It's really like, um, 
it's almost like I, I, I've got to get back to the same thing. Like, what does this need? Okay, this needs to be a little bit more primitive. You know, this doesn't need to be this uh, glorious celestial, you know, thing going on. We're writing, you know, Beethoven or Mozart or something. This has to be something kind of really goofy. So we kind of did like some ham-fisted stuff. So I had a piano that had a broken block and that meant that it was impossible to tune. And so therefore it was in the studio with us. And um, as the years went by during Courage, it got worse and worse. So that uh, you can hear various you know, times in the show where it's just out of tune and terrible. Um, it doesn't matter what we played on, it would still sound terrible. So that was kind of the way that um, the thing developed. And it was like, in the case of something like Perfect, there were times when it was beautifully played and then times when it was really crappily played. And it sort of um, mirrored what was going on, you know, with the characters. And so therefore, you know, I don't even think about it. I mean, Andy Ezrin is an incredible musician. He's incredible. He's played with everybody. He's played with Sting. He's played with Herbie Hank. I mean, he's incredible, you know, and um, right now he's off on the road with uh, Madeline Peru. He's really good. And, um, you know, he can literally play anything, but if he has to play stupid, he's totally into it. He'll play stupid, you know, and we'll put like bad notes in, you know, and if it's something that would be like, for instance, if it was something that needed to um, be deconstructed. So I would have Andy play it into the computer really beautifully. And then I would mess it up. I would take notes out. I would make notes flat or sharp. I would just make them all messed up. So he didn't have to think about it. And when he heard it back, he'd laugh. So it was, you know, it was whatever happened. So yeah, it's like, it's kind of like, also, there are things that we would do too, where like Andy doesn't play guitar. Uh, I don't play flute. So there were episodes where he played guitar and I played flute and it was terrible. You know, we just didn't know how to, we didn't know really how to make it work. So we did it like, and it made the structure of the score just really childlike and fun. Cause we were really trying, you know, like we really tried to play it, but we couldn't play it. So who cares? You know, just stuff like that, where it just was messed up. And I think people really love that. Like I said, that's a real talent that I can appreciate as an adult. Unfortunately, a lot of the complexity was lost on me as a kid because I joked that I was pretty tone deaf. My musical experience was playing hot cross buns very badly on the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and while I still have an advance past hot cross buns, I can now appreciate it more. You have to make it sound bad, but not like a cat running across a keyboard bad. And I have the utmost respect for that. The only other example that I can think besides you guys that did it quite as well was in the first final episode of Futurama, where Christopher Ting first has to establish Fry's ineptitude in music. <laughs> then utilizing it to create a very simple childlike score, which is thematically very appropriate in its crafting of a beautiful and tender ending to the series. Please don't stop playing, Fry. I want to hear how it ends. Which to me is one of the best moments of the entire series, and much like here with yours and Andy's score, it's also one of the best moments of the entire series. I really think that the whole idea of being an amateur or being primitive within the confines of what you're talking about, I think that it just brings something to it. It brings a kind of humanity to it. You know, it's not perfect, but so what? It's good. 
there's a lot of real interesting things inside the show. For instance, uh, Linda Semensky, who was the head of Cartoon Network at the time, um, really was instrumental. And she's a very good friend of John's, was instrumental in getting the show on. And um, so she plays sitar. So Muriel plays sitar. And that um, a good deal of the music that's played uh, when Muriel first sits down and starts playing sitar is Linda Semensky. In uh, the show, uh, The Great Fusili, that's actually Courage playing drums. That's Marty Grabstein, who came into the studio and was hanging, and he used to be a drummer in high school. So he said, look, take a snare drum and just start banging some stuff, and we're going to put it in. So it became part of the the theme for Fusilli, and it just felt very amateurish and very fun and added just to this flavor, you know, to have somebody who's an amateur sitar player or an amateur drummer or there were a couple of other people that came in. I'm trying to remember now, but um, yeah, it was just, it was just cool because it made something really special and they loved doing it. They're really into doing it. Yeah, and that works so well because, you know, Muriel's an amateur. She's not great, so doesn't need to be great. And with Fusilli, he's just a con man. He's putting in the bare minimum amount of effort to make sure his con works. And anything beyond that isn't necessary. So, again, it's not very good. Exactly right. That's really, really, that hits the nail on the head. I agree. It's not the most polished thing. And sometimes not the most polished thing works really well we did a lot of stuff that was really you know crazy that nobody did before like uh, we did this thing it was in the beaver's tail and in conway the contaminationist where um either andy and i would depress the sustain pedals on the piano and i would run my nail across the strings and it would create this weird cacophonous sound Sweep the porch like I asked you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, when we get a lake? A lake? Gorgeous. But where do you suppose it came from? Who cares? It's mine now. And we do all these weird things on the piano, and the guy's like pulling his hair out, thinking we're going to smash his strings, or I, I would drop a tuning fork or a pencil on it or something. And we record it. It's like some John Cage classical music from the 1950s or 60s or something. But what was cool about it was in the beaver's tail, it sounded like the surface of the water. It was like, you know, you had this water that suddenly filled up nowhere or in Conway the Contaminationist, um, it was just dark, just this bouncy polluted sounding thing. With the good air, in with the bad. Out with the good air, in with the bad. You know, we did everything that we could to get out of the idea that we were doing a regular score for a cartoon. That we're doing that, 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 you know, we did those too, you know, it was kind of like we did whatever. I love doing the opposite also. So a lot of the stuff that when you're saying, oh yeah, that was perfect. It might've been the opposite, but it just worked, you know, like we would try different stuff. And um, that particular stuff was also really part and parcel, the experimental nature of courage. And John would love that when we do something really crazy. He would love that. So we got away with it. So now the series is over, but before we get into any other topics, there's one thing I do want to bring up in depth now. As I've mentioned, more casual fans of the show seem to just remember Courage as being the scary series, which, like I said, the majority of the episodes are. So there is part of me that gets that. But it also really pains me that episodes like Last of the Star Makers, Remembrance of Courage Past, The Mask, and Perfect are really not brought up as often as something like Freaky Fred or Curse of King Ramses. So, John, do you think the perception that a lot of people have that this is just the scary show is an unfair representation? 
the show had so many dimensions. Uh, it's open for whatever group is interested. Of course, horror is easy. And uh, when you mix horror with comedy, it becomes a kind of novelty. So no. Now, Marty, I see that you're pondering the question. What are your thoughts? Um, I think it's actually very good for it to be known as being a scary show because it gives it that edge. And you need an edge anyway for posterity to kick in, I think, to, for real posterity to kick in. So the idea that, you know, that it's scary, you know, it's this wonderful cartoon with this little pink dog jumping up and down in the middle of nowhere. And it's, the music is very, and God bless Jody Grafe and Andy Ezra for the music they did, you know, very upbeat. And then they would mm, make it scary sounding sometimes, right? But I think the scary part let that be what brings people in and then let them be pleasantly surprised with the hunchback of nowhere. Uh, you know, not looking for, oh, sometimes it's hard, but like, oh, shoot, this was unconventional. The, you know, to keeping people guessing. But, you know, to bring people in, I think what did it, what kept it alive as much as it did, uh, was the, you know, that it was more, you know, scary. And that even, you know, Scooby, who's a, it's an empire. I mean, Scooby-Doo, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, all of the scary things were costumed, people in costumes, whereas Courage's monsters were real. So I kind of dug that. So it was a little bit more like not only for kids, kind of a little bit more. With Scooby-Doo was more for, mainly for kids, really, mostly, you know. And then people look back on it and they get a kick out of it because they remember, you know, whereas I think, I mean, I, I mean, there are people that can watch Courage, not kids, that could get a kick out of it, I think, you know, like Bugs Bunny a little bit in that respect, you know. Now, Jody, you were in an interesting position because the tone of your scores was dictated by the scripts. And I have to say, I think your emotional scores are the best of the series, personally, especially the two parters where you got to be more cinematic and really play with them. So does it ever bother you that these more cinematic, you know, tender scores don't get as much attention as something like Freaky Fred or The Curse of King Ramses? Um, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we get a lot of accolades for is The Last of the Star Makers. You know, people love that theme. you know, that solo piano stuff. And um, so uh, I would say that while the majority love the really dark, scary, you know, ironic, weird stuff, uh, people are always citing The Last of the Star Makers as one of the most, somebody said, it's like the most beautiful score on television. No, I don't think so. I'm not going to accept that, but thank you. That might have been me, actually. But, you know, it's just really it's but it's also that stuff's baked into the um, what it is. And, I, you know, there is some dark stuff in that. Obviously, the star maker passes away, and lays eggs. And, you know, there's the army stuff in that episode. Yeah, It's the same thing with that you mentioned earlier, Hunchback. It's the same kind of thing. We get a lot of because of that bell theme and that lovely interaction between courage and the hunchback in the barn and stuff, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, that episode had a lot of darkness in it too, but I guess the point is, it's kind of like, I do get a lot, now that I think about it, a lot of people do mention that stuff, maybe not as much as they mentioned Freaky Fred or Jalos or the stuff that you would think they would all, you know, mention. But that stuff is so strange in many ways, you know. But uh, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I'll take accolades anywhere. People like are really into something, um, you know. Okay, so I'm technically going out of order with this next topic, but I refuse to allow this to be the last thing we discuss. 
So yes, let's dive into a crossover movie with Scooby-Doo that shall remain nameless. Straight out of nowhere, Scooby-Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog was released in 2021, and outside of Jody and Andy coming back to do the music, Marty Thea and frequent guest voice actor Paul Shuffler doing the voices, none of the creative team, including John, David, or William, were asked to come back. It, 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 I'm curious, when you're saying, is that based on your opinion of it, or... Uh... I'm not fishing for anything here. I, I'm just curious. Well, first I want to say, no disrespect to the filmmakers. I don't actually think they were sitting around rubbing their hands together evilly, plotting on how to screw over John, David, or William or anything like that. That obviously came from higher up decisions. These were just the guys who got hired to do it. This came out in an era where Scooby-Doo and a lot of other Hanna-Barbera properties are just cashing in on nostalgia, but not really paying respect to what they're cashing in on. I don't know if we actually needed this crossover the same way we didn't need Tom and Jerry meeting Willy Wonka or Scooby-Doo returning to Zombie Island. Yeah, you probably could do really good stories with any of those crossovers, but let's be honest. None of these stories were being told particularly because someone at Warner Brothers had a really good story they wanted to tell. Just someone at Warner Brothers thought, hey, we can cash in on that nostalgia. That's the thing. They didn't care if they're particularly good or not. They want to be able to have the thumbnail that says, ooh, Scooby-Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog, and people will click on it. And that's my problem. If you're going to bring Courage back after 20 years, make it good. So, David, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's, 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 it's interesting to hear you say that. And, then, you know, gratifying isn't the word. I mean, you know, do I wish I'd worked on it? Maybe. Um... You know, it was, it's an interesting challenge. How do you fit those two worlds together? And I probably, you know, would, you know, eventually figure out a way that worked for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's difficult. And really, I'll mention again, I mean, just to, you know, so that we're not just ragging on, on this movie done by very, you know, talented people. What we had at Cartoon Network when we were doing Courage and what everyone else, you know, at that time had in Linda Semensky uh, uh, it was, was someone who was running the network with courage. Uh, and I didn't even think about that word <laughs> when I said it just now. Uh, she really, she had the courage that few executives had have, which is let the people you've entrusted with a lot of money to make television shows, let them do their jobs, give them room. You're giving them room or you're giving them rope with which to hang themselves. And it truly, it was the show that had the, the, the least amount of network notes and, you know, changes. It was, it was, you know, John, it was, most of the notes that I was dealing with were John's. You know, occasionally the network would say something, but one of my favorite notes from the network, and this was, this was from Standards and Practices, a uh, little anecdote. Um, I think it, is it in Courage in the Big Stinking City? Um, he's going to a room and I num and the, the room number or the address of the place, I forget it was a room number or a street address, was 666. And, and the, the, the note was, uh, this is, you know, this really speaks to devil worship and Satanism. And, you know, we, we, we think it better not to have it in the show, which I, it, that didn't come from Linda necessarily against standards and practices. But I, and I laughed at think, thinking about all of the twisted stuff that we've had in the show. This number was, so I, I said, okay, can we make it six, six, six and a half? And they said, yeah, that's fine. You just made a joke even better. I don't even know what the half means, but it's like it's like six 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 and a little more evil, well, half of a point more evil than just plain six six six. And, and yeah, that that stands out as as like the, maybe the, one of the biggest notes we got, and it allowed us to flourish. Now, William, I'm gonna guess you're a pretty big fan of this, right? No. <laughs> That was a mistake. I mean, I mean, you know, I understand the the marketing people wanting this to happen to because they had to, they got their their channel and they got to have somebody watch their stupid channel. But um, you know, you know, it, the the first reaction I had when I heard about it was like, you know, why can't they live in their own worlds? They their worlds don't intermingle, you know. And 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 the the only gag I came up with 
that I thought was okay. Everything was about the Scooby-Doo gang getting completely demolished because they think everybody's like wearing a mask. Uh, you know, so but I was my, my, my thing was just like, you know, they, they come up and the snowman's there and one of them goes, oh, you're just wearing a mask. And they lift the snowman's head up and his head is like, there's just, this, there's no head under there. And the head starts talking to them. You know, like, you know, ha ha ha, you know, uh, just been not, you know, whatever the, you know, his Sean Connery accent. Showing great minds think alike, this gag was actually used in Scooby Doo on Zombie Island to lampoon the mask trope. One could imagine the gag being enhanced by the snowman scolding the Scooby gang, as William suggested. But it was like two worlds that didn't, they don't belong together. It's like, uh, you know, except in a marketer's mind. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the thing is like, how do you balance? marketing the need to make money the need to cover your costs i mean you know an animated series that is not cheap it, it, it you know no matter how much they try to rip us off when we're working it's still not cheap it, it's still you've got to pay people and it adds up and you've got to figure out a way like how am i going to make the most money out of this or and not get fired well they all get fired any eventually anyway so maybe it's a pointless task for the executives but you know, you, you, there, there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, balance in there and it, versus the, you know, the creativity and the commercial, commercial n nature of this whole thing. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing about this, because, yes, there's diehard fans and the show is available on streaming and DVD, but they haven't really done much with this brand. There's not reboots like with Samurai Jack or Powerpuff Girls. It doesn't seem to air that often anymore. So I really wonder how many kids who were meant to watch this had really any real frame of reference who Courage was. Uh, I, I, you know, the same time that was happening was when they were coming to us to revive this series about five years ago, four or five years ago. And John and I put a lot of work into it. Um, you know, he, he, he drew an animatic. We put that together. We did. Uh, we did voice. We did. We, we did voices. Thea was there, and then they uh, changed their mind. We wrote um, a bunch of episodes. We had the whole season planned out as is is story stuff, and uh, we made an animatic. And uh, I think one of the two things happened. Uh, everyone who came up with the idea was fired, uh, and then the new people were like, "Ah, uh -uh, nothing. We don't. We, we don't use other people's ideas. We we're gonna come up with new ideas." Uh, or they just decided that it wasn't the time, but that was the same area that this Courage Scooby-Doo uh, combo movie was was come up with, and um, I, they, had, they may have had some sort of overriding plan, and and they did the movie themselves over in L.A. It was all their people, so they had a lot more control over it than these two old wackos. <laughs> who <laughs> coming up with the, the, the same weird stuff. Yeah, and that's why I feel bad continuously harping on it. I'm sure they're really great people, but they just didn't understand courage. And like I said, at the same time, I'm sure you could do a good movie with this, but you probably shouldn't. Scooby and Courage should just live in their own separate universes and only really cross over for a promo or the occasional bumper. <laughs> Dig this, yappy dog. We'll handle all the creepy villain angles on this network. Well, yappy dog. <laughs> Stupid dog. You made me miss who the villain was. Hey, like, what's this? Ah! Oh, courage. It's only the Cartoon Network. Now I'll never get to sleep. Now, Marty, obviously you worked on this, so despite my misgivings to the movie in general, you still gave a really good performance. So what was it like coming back all these years later? That that movie, because John was not in, involved in it, um, and, uh, you know, I think that was by his design or that he didn't agree with, he didn't like the, this is what I got from him. And listen, he's a real artist. I mean, John is an artist. He's not a, a pompous or, you know, like, celebrity type i'm so important he's an artist he's got a lot of love he does it for love of the game he made a lot of money i'm sure off this damn thing but 
it, it sounds to me like he'll turn down money if it doesn't quite hit him the right way. And so I have a lot of respect for John and, and what he does with that. And I, I think he didn't like the crossover idea. He doesn't think that two universes should be together. You know, John and I um, appeared along with Thea and, and Paul uh, Scheffler in this galaxy con when the talk of the Scooby-Doo movie, he knew we had said, yes, Thea and I both did it. How about how wonderful was that, that she got to do courage one last time, right? As, as that turned out, uh, Paul, uh, John said that- I wouldn't suggest that, uh, let's say any one of our uh, esteemed uh, personalities get uh, mutated or deformed with some other to, offer a novelty of the original. I'm happy with the original. Of course. That being said, how excited I was that this movie took place in Courage's universe, pretty much. The Scooby-Doo people visited his universe. So they kept a lot of the essence of, right, of, uh, of uh, you know, Courage's life. And yes, there were certain things that had to be somewhat watered down just a little bit, but I think they were pretty damn good with considering that it was a crossover. Uh, I think they pretty much honored courage beautifully in that movie. And well, I don't want, if anybody hasn't seen it, then I don't want to give it away, but I will tell you that in, in the wrap up courage figures extraordinarily importantly in the climax of the film, let's put it that way, without saying anything. I don't want to give it away. But uh, but what I love personally about that, going back to our previous conversation, John wasn't involved in it. The people there that were, you know, worked with me on it and they actually did put words. <laughs> Courage did have about, it was more like the way you suggested maybe it should have been done 50% less than it had been in the early phrases, but still having him say lines sometimes. Spiders! Yeah. Grab the wheel. Okay, okay. Me too. Oh, no mercy. <laughs> Space aliens. <laughs> it worked. Points. Courage. That's me. Courage. Courage do we do. Good night, folks. Bye. And that is how the movie was done. I, I was tickled from that personally between you and me and anybody else who's listening to this lovely podcast. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but like I said, even though I might not like it and I don't think it has really good creativity not having John, David, or William in it, I will say when they do get something right, and in this case, it's your vocal performance, they do get it right. So I have to give it credit for that at least. Also, I know we've been hearing it throughout this retrospective, but I do have to say it is super impressive to hear how easily you slid back into that role after like a 20 year break. I had still done a few like they there was still like these um, promo spots that went in 2004 and 2005. But and so I still came in every once in a while to promote uh, the reruns and things like that. And so occasionally. But yes, certainly after 2005, nothing at all. Um, but you know, I guess that's where the convention world comes in. I only started doing that actually six years ago. So in that I have to kind of do this. I gotta go all the things I do for love. Yeah, I have to do that. So I worked, I've been working, I've been working on that for the last six years. So I think it kind of helped me probably with the uh with the movie. You do have to warm up the vocal cords to scream. Yeah. So, Jody, outside of the voice actors, you and Andy are the only crew members from the original series to work on this movie. What were your experiences like on it, and how do you view it overall? And it's like we did a lot of Easter eggs and a lot of different things in it, but it's like a totally different thing. It's not Courage the Cowardly Dog. It's Scooby with Courage. The animation styles, they blended really, really well together. And I think the production guys did a really good job, but it's not the same thing. You know, it's just not the same thing. And um, I hope it was successful for them. I was happy to do it. Um, I just uh, thought it's wonderful that Thea got a last shot 
you know, at being Muriel because she's so wonderful. She's so wonderful. I wish everybody could have hung out with her for about five minutes because she was the sweetest person in the world. Um, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. You know, every once in a while they talk about bringing courage back and all that kind of stuff. But slowly but surely, you know, stuff fades. I don't know if you can reboot that. So now to close out on the last Courage content actually sanctioned by John. John, in 2013, you wrote and directed an eight-minute CGI short called The Fog of Courage. So what was it like coming back to the series all these years later? And is it true that this was meant to be a potential pilot for a revival? The Fog of Courage was an initiative done in Hong Kong by Turner Asia. And they wanted to continue courage. I don't think they understood why the network wasn't doing anymore. And they loved it for their market. And it was their intention to uh, do it in CG, which I was fine with. Cartoon Network didn't have anything to do with it. They didn't support it. They, they didn't want it to happen. But Turner Asia found the money to make the pilot by not making another cartoon that they were involved in. So they just reallocated the money so that I could do it. And I produced it in, I did a lot of it in Spain, working with Betty Close, uh, a CG producer. And then we went to Singapore and they did the heavy lifting. And uh, when we finished it, uh, the executives from, Hong Kong were called into Los Angeles and there was no more courage. Instead, it got, it got stuck on a Scooby-Doo video. So that for the time being is the last of courage. We're left with 52 really great episodes, two fantastic short films, and the crossover movie of Scooby-Doo. So now I want to focus on the legacy of the show and the fan reactions to it all these years later. So David, do you have any interactions with fans that stick out in your mind? I don't know if I saw it or Jody was telling me about it, but there was an interview with Billy Bob Thornton and uh, Angelina Jolie. And it was, if I remember correctly, or if I was told this correctly, uh, he, he said, oh, we'd love to, he put it very bluntly, uh, 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 I, 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 there might be children watching this, and of course, I don't want to. I doubt, and if they are, the hell with them. He said, "Yeah, you know, sometimes we fuck and then just watch Courage the Cowardly Dog." And then, and I thought, "Wow, that's a pretty interesting three-way right there." <laughs> you know, it's like they're having sex, and then they like to chill. So about Netflix and chill, this is chill and courage. Oh God, that is just too perfect. I mean, that had to be really surreal to have like a super famous person talking about your work like that. This is at the risk of, of name dropping, you know, in, in, I had Sigourney Weaver hug me because my son was in school with her daughter and he knew that her and they were like 11 at the time. And we knew that the daughter was a Courage fan. And then I met Sigourney Weaver at sort of a parents meeting when I was introduced to her. And this was while Courage was in production. I said, I'm Julian's dad. And, and she threw her arms around me and said, oh God, we love your show. And I was like, Sigourney Weaver, if I ever thought about meeting you, it didn't go like this. It's just, it would be me telling you how much I love your stuff. You don't know. You just don't know who's watching. And it doesn't, you know, whether it's sort of the excitement of someone like Sigourney Weaver saying, I love your show, uh, or somebody saying a, a fan coming out of nowhere or, on a podcast saying this show got me through some really dark times and kept me laughing. Uh, when you're doing a show, you're just, you're so wrapped up in getting it done. Uh, you don't, you, you really don't know who it's reaching and, and, you know, it's easy to say that's better than residuals. Um, in a way it is. Um, I mean, I guess residuals will help you through life. <laughs> It'll help you pay for bills, whereas feeling good about what you've done, you know, makes you feel better about life, you know, or, or the life you've chosen. 
I, I'm just thrilled to know that there are so many stories that I will never know, you know, so many lives that things that I've done have affected, you know, so it really guides me further through, you know, what I, what I do now. And also reflecting on the fact that when you do, when you do this kind of thing for a living and your kids are 11 years old, you know, you're embarrassed by your parents at that age. So it didn't matter that I was working on a show that was very popular among his friends. He didn't want me to mention it at all. And then I, I did mention it when I had a car load full of his friends. I said, sorry, Julian, I just have to ask your friends a question. Do any of you watch Courage the Cowardly Dog? And they all kind of exploded with glee. And uh, it was kind of a breakthrough moment, I think, uh, for Julian and me, my son, when he realized, wow, what my dad does is popular with my friends. And the number one fear is that your parents are going to embarrass you in front of your friends, you know? And when I say that, it brings me back to courage and just how much of my life actually found its way into the show. Uh, and how many of my own demons I exercised, which I didn't even realize while I was doing it, I realize it more now. And I realize it more when I'm talking to fans who've had experience with the show. And I'm like, well, you know, writing can be therapeutic. Just finishing the fucking script and getting it in on time is even more therapeutic, <laughs> but um, it's only now in reflection, you know, when I think about certain episodes or, you know, moments where I say, okay, what would happen now? And I reach into my life and say, well, something had happened to one of my kids. Um, this is more common for episodes of Arthur that I wrote, but even with Courage, you know, it's like, how would my son react to this? You know, how would I react to this if I were, that character, because as you're writing, you're becoming each character. Uh, you know, again, you have to write from the inside out. You know, sometimes it startles me to see what I come up with. And 20 years later, it startles me to, to realize, oh my God, I was telling a story about myself there and I didn't realize it. Now, Marty, were you at all aware of how big this show was or did that come only really when you started doing the conventions? Really, it was the conventions. Uh, I not that I, I knew it was successful because it went four seasons. And I know that when I would run into people and I would say I did it, I would hear some inklings of, oh, my God, really? And I was saying, oh, wow, they really loved it. You know, I'd, I'd hear it. But at conventions, it's just like you see all these people that are, you know, and sometimes they're lined up which is really what if it's a big convention, sometimes I'll get like lines and stuff, you know, so that's like, oh, my God, how wonderful that is. I never tire of that. You know, I mean, that's, you know, forget about that. It's a this fight, you know, the financial remuneration of it, the pleasure of seeing people and that I made, you know, my performance of this wonderful character that was supplied to me by John Dilworth and all the people that created that show and made it made it such a wonderful show you know that somehow me bringing that character to life you know made a difference in people's lives that makes me really happy you know and just you know in general going beyond the finances you know all right so i think we're at the final question so we're 28 years removed from the original short and nearly 25 years from the series premiere Looking back on everything we've discussed in this retrospective and reflecting on everything you know about the series, what do you think its legacy is? I think, you know, um, whether it has influenced a lot of animators and a lot of other folks, you know, creative folks, I, you know, like, I think that part of the legacy is that uh, I think it has influenced some people. A lot of, you know, up and coming people have asked me a lot of questions or done interviews about that. And I know John has had that. John mentor has mentored some people. Um, I think it kind of uh, changed the landscape of humor for a little window. I don't know. I don't know if something like that could be made now again, you know, um, which kind of makes me sad because there's so much political correctness you know, in the world and stuff. Um, I think it, I think it just kind of changed, it kind of changed the language. And I think you'll see maybe looking back and double this time in 50 years or something, I think people are going to go, wow, this is extraordinary. I mean, I'm so happy that it's still around, you know, after 20 years and that people really love it. But I don't know, like, 
I, I, I think it's done some really good things as far as an iconic show. I just, I wish I knew it's like Crick Felucci as well. You know, I don't know if you could go back and do this stuff. You know, that was, uh, they were very thoughtful people at the head of Cartoon Network. And um, they let John have an incredibly long leash. And I'm pretty sure they knew what they were getting into. You know, John was not a quiet guy about, you know, his opinions about anything, you know. So um, I, I hope that it continues to infect people, you know, um, uh, as the years go on, you know, because I think it, uh, it's definitely br just so brilliant and such a wonderful show. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, speaking out of turn i'm so proud to have been part of it it's, it was a wonderful experience but um it would it's just too bad because i think that there's that there's more than anything you're right there are gay characters there's a lot of other stuff going on you know but there's a kind of a carefulness of stuff you know it's not like like you said it's not like boom some of the stuff is covert but it's like covert over it's just like in your face you know um, and courage was in your face completely. And courage was also such a lovely, lovely character. You know, I, you know, some of the things that were so great was, uh, you know, when courage sewed up the hole in the ozone layer, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff is like, it, that's John, you know, let's do something where courage sews up the ozone layer, you know? I, I, wow. That's a question. I think I want people to remember the show for its uh, open, it, it, it's actually it was, I think it's I think it was an open openness. There's openness to that show. I'm sure there's other shows since then that have replicated it, in, you know, in some in their own way. Uh, but you know, the idea is that it, 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 every you know nothing in that show was was like rope. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, Courage is going to scream. We know that that's rote. You know, Muriel's going to get kidnapped by a, a goose god. That's rote. You know, or, or whatever, but uh, you know the rest of the thing, all the different concepts. I mean, I think we were there was a lot of things coming from a lot of different directions in the show, and um, you know, I, the show was probably more psychological than a lot of shows. I, I can't say that's good or bad, um, but John certainly gave it that edge, and I think that's uh, you know a, a more of a legacy than maybe you know a gag or two that I, you know, one of us came up with, uh, you know, so I, I, I mean, I, I have my favorite episodes, but you know, they're, I worked on them and I have some sort of connection to those more than other episodes. Uh, so that's my legacy. It's like, I like that episode, <laughs> you know, a courage versus Mecca courage. That's, uh, that's my, my personal favorite, but that's because my contribution, I feel proud of it. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I, you know, I, I could ask it of you because you're from a generation that grew up watching it. And, you know, when you're from the inside, you don't quite always have the same, you know, it, it, it doesn't hit you the same. It's like, you, you know, there's a spoon hiding behind that, that part of the set, you know, it's like, oh, why didn't I move that spoon? No one can see it, but I should have moved it. I mean, yeah, I've met filmmakers like that. You know, it's, it's like, you know, they can't divorce themselves from the physical making of, of their product. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. I, I just feel that I hope that uh, other people in the future who get to do a series or animation, you know, look at the visuals, look at the fact that we weren't, uh, you know, filling the thing up, unlike me talking with constant talk. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, it, that's one of my complaints of stuff I've seen recently. It's just everyone's talking nonstop. And we would slow down. We would have quietness. We would have beautiful visuals. We would have just animation, you know, just physical animation, which is our, our, our Warner Brothers, uh, you know, influence was that, you know, Warner Brothers cartoon wasn't nonstop talk. Nonstop talk is to save money. 
quite frankly. I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, I can complain about it, but I also understand the realities of, of, of not, it's cheaper to hire the guy who does the lip reading uh, thing, or I, I forget the name of the, you know, I've, I've worked in the business, I don't even know the names of some of these jobs anymore. Oh, uh, but, but, you know, that talking saves time in terms of, you know, it saves money. And but it, it is also it's a, it, I think I would hope that there would be shows that would be like, you know, people would look at it and say, oh, you know, we use our eyes too. you know, it's not just our it's not just our ears. Lately, I've done several interviews like this of different different forms. And, uh, you know, it it it, it fills it really fills my heart. Your reaction to the show was my experience writing it in many cases. You know, I really, I, I treasure being able to sort of reconnect with myself through experiences like this. Uh, so th thank you so much for, uh, for you know, thank you and, and all, all of the fans for paying attention and, uh, you know, the details and courage, but also the very clear center of the show. Um, you know, which had a lot to do with heart and love and the things, you know, things we do for that. Um, and that we can, you know, with love for another person, perhaps, you know, we can overcome a lot of our, a lot of our fears and a lot of our, um, you know, you got to put them aside. But yeah, there was a lot of heart in the show and heart was, is really at the center of it. I mean, how could it, how could there not be that kind of thing? It, you know, it, it all emanates from the title character, you know, and it, it's certainly reflective of, you know, John and his sensibility and mine. And, and uh, you know, then it was up to Jody to, to write, to score it so that it didn't feel, you know, so that it didn't feel sappy, you know, whether you're scoring it, you know, like a big movie or scoring it nice and small or whatever. Um, man, he always just would give it the right, the right touch, the right touch. So th thank you so much for not being shy about, you know, putting, putting your voice out there and, you know, letting us know what you thought of the show. Not all of it is kind, <laughs> but most of the conversations I've had about courage have been, you know, just wonderful and so fulfilling. And this is certainly, uh, uh, you know, at the top of the list. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. But again, the pleasure is truly mine. And, you know, I have to speak on behalf of a lot of people from my generation. I know you couldn't have foreseen that 20 plus years on, we would still be such diehard fans and that this would inspire us to become filmmakers and artists and whatnot. But really, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this. This is just truly such an important show to a lot of people. Well, thank, thank you for watching. And, and uh, you know, when and if you've got kids, you know, let me know how they do, <laughs> uh, you know, 20 years from now, uh, if you're showing them episodes of the show. <laughs> oh, I will. I just hope CPS doesn't step in. Um, that brings me up to my like final point with you. You know, you hear a lot of people in my generation say, oh, this show created my childhood or this show was my childhood. So how does the term you created my childhood reconcile with your legacy for the show? Wow. That's really something that phrase, you know, just, you know, created my childhood or helped, you know, it's, wow. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, when you're doing it, you don't want to think about it because it's, 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 you know, it could feel like a burden, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, but you're writing for kids. That's a big responsibility, you know, and, and uh, I think, you know, they deserve great storytelling. I think great storytelling helps the mind develop. Marty, what's your view on it? Well, here's, here's really what I, what I say about it. I am, you know, again, the conventions really solidified this with me. Because <clears throat> I have people that sometimes come up to me in the conventions and they're like looking at me like, like that. And then I also hug people you know, after we, you know, say goodbye, I'm big on that. If they want a hug, you know, uh, and I've had people cry when they see me, 
like, like literally break down in tears. And, you know, sometimes like, you know, I used to watch this with my grandmother and these were moments when we were together and, or, or um, you know, you, you were my childhood. You got me through my childhood. And I realized that a lot of people that come to these conventions are people that are a little bit, you know, kind of off the beaten track, so to speak. Not, uh, not only, but I'm seeing a very high percentage of people that, you know, when they talk about nerds, you know, or you know, people speak about, you know, what a, a nerd is, which has become this, you know, like badge of honor, actually, in today's world, as I am a nerd kind of thing. Um, but, you know, people that are, you know, that have had troubles, that have struggled in their lives, uh, that have had pain uh, in their childhood and difficulties and sad, deep sadness and fears, anxieties, tremendous. It's so big anxiety in the world we live in today, especially the world we live in today. Uh, and so for young people, anxiety is a very real thing. So when they see this little dog who's so, you know, scared of everything, so terrified of everything, somehow on the 11th hour pulls it together to face his fears and, you know, basically save those he loves and perhaps save the world on some level. So there's a wonderful, you know, inherent message to this whole show, which is, you know, face your fears. We understand we all have them and fear and anxiety is, you know, we know you have them, but it's like, if courage can do it, you can do it kind of thing. And I think, I, you know, at the risk, again, at risk of sounding too precious, I think there was absolutely truth to that, that a lot of people really did. Uh, and some of these people felt good about the fact, they felt it, 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 it resonated with them. You know, this idea of their own anxieties and, 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 and perhaps having been abused or, you know, sadness and, and terror and whatever it is, and that, somehow courage comforted them, you know, and that you too can be a hero. You are a hero. You know, it's, it's, it's a great message, you know, that I was so fortunate to be a part of, you know, that, yeah, I mean, I created the voice. Yes. Wonderful. I helped breathe life into this character and it reached people, but ultimately it was this just wonderful spirit that it just exists in the show that I think is timeless. And I think it will always be appreciated because of that. It'll never go out of style, you know, that message, right? So now we come back to the man who started all. John, what's your view? I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't get the legacy part. I, of course, I love that I, we all did something good in the world. I always say that. And that if fans continue to discover this cartoon that's being squashed, absolutely. And they get something out of it generation over generation. And I know because I hear from them. Uh, it's a great, it's, for me, it's a great honor that I've, I've, I've done something, something worthwhile. And uh, that's what I get out of it. So there we have it. And for me, all I think I can say about this show is there's a lot of shows that I've viewed in childhood that I go back to, and they're pretty bad. Like, I don't know why I liked it. The vast majority, though, I can go back and be like, wow, this is still really good. I enjoy it. But there's only a handful, very few, where I can go back to it and be like, wow, this is actually better than what I remember. I actually get more enjoyment now watching this than I did as a kid. I mean, Courage the Cowardly Dog is one of them. The life lessons on how to be brave, deal with abuse, deal with the loss of a loved one, and countless other life lessons, all wrapped up in such a beautifully, wonderfully, hilarious, and terrifying show, is just such a joy to have. To me, the biggest influence this show had is teaching me not to be so scared. I was a scaredy cat growing up, much like Courage. And even though I really liked Scooby-Doo, which had its own cowardly characters of Shaggy and Scooby, Courage was the one that really helped me the most. Yes, Scooby and Shaggy were able to overcome their fears, but that came from the encouragement of their friends. Courage didn't have that luxury. He had to find the strength within himself to be brave. 
And that's a very powerful lesson from a not-so-cowardly dog with the apparently very appropriate name of Courage. So I think that's a good note to end on. I'd like to thank all my guests for not only coming on, but helping to create such a classic part of my childhood. So unfortunately, the time to say goodbye has come. Jody, it's truly been a pleasure. Good. Thank you so much. Really great. I'm glad you really love, you know, you're one of those crazed people that really love this show. It's a certain sensibility, you know, it truly is. William, it was great having you on. Really enjoyed talking about all those great gags, including Eustace falling down the stairs. Thank you for having me. I, I had a good time. Uh, I'm always, always nice to talk to somebody who was uh, positively influenced by the show. I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, weirdly, I haven't had a good night's sleep since 1999. <laughs> also, coincidentally, my hair went gray around the same time. Yeah, this has died. <laughs> Yeah, but see, nothing ever got you at night. we That's from us. We saved you from all those things that could have gotten you at night. We did good work, I, I must say. You very much did. Thank you for stopping by. David, it was great talking to you about all those classic episodes you wrote. And Freaky Fred. Godspeed, Andrew Watts. Yes, edit this. Make, this. make me sound coherent. Oh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun editing this one but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marty, it was really great hearing from you and from courage. Hey, listen, man, it's been, it's been a pleasure work, you know, talking to you. You obviously know your stuff about courage. I've been interviewed on numerous podcasts by people. You are by far the guy that seems to know the most about stuff. Uh, so anyway, so I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. This has been terrific and uh, let's do it again sometime. Thank you. That that means a lot to hear. And yeah, this was really cool. We'll for sure have to have you back on, maybe do a commentary or two. Wasn't it cool, Andrew? Wasn't it cool? Well, hearing Courage say my name is so cool, but that usually means something bad's about to happen. <laughs> also, I want to point out, if you want to hear Courage say your name, check out Marty's cameo. The link will be in the description. Oh, direct people to the cameo! And also, my uh, pages. Facebook and uh, and Instagram. Well, I certainly will. Those links are also in the description. So again, Marty, thank you for coming on. Take care, everybody. Lastly, John, thank you for coming on and thank you so much for making this show. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Lastly, I just want to thank you all for sticking around and watching this monster length retrospective. This is by far the largest and most complicated thing I've ever done on the show, but for courage, it's worth it. Not to give up the ghost a little bit, all these interviews were done separately and were much, much longer. Not wanting to let that rich material go to waste, though, I decided to put a playlist in the description with the unedited interviews with everyone. So if you want to hear even more about Courage, click the link below. So until next time, I'm Andrew Wasp, and I hope you've enjoyed your time with us.